I'm a singer, I'm a drummer. Either of those two would do. <laughs> Welcome to the A to Z of Phil Collins. I'll take it to check, but I prefer the cash. <laughs> the idea behind this podcast is to take a journey through the life and music of Phil Collins. When I said yes to do the job, it was just to write the songs. But as I did the demos, they decided they couldn't see anybody else singing them. We'll talk about events like Band-Aid. It was an ego-free day. Pay tribute to friends like Eric Clapton and Robert Plant and tackle subjects including reunions, gorillas and the importance of a good drum fill. Stories, songs, memories, each one represented by a different letter from A to Z. I always used to watch the Oscars and, you know, you wonder what it's like to be up there and then suddenly you get an opportunity. And the winner is... Everything I've done has been really a bit like jazz. This is the A to Z of Phil Collins podcast. With me, Phil Collins. Hello and welcome to episode one of the A to Z of Phil Collins. I'm your host, Matt Everett, and appropriately enough, my guest is... Phil Collins himself. In this podcast, we'll be going through the A to Z of Phil's life and career so far, picking out different moments, songs and stories, some of which you may have heard, some I'm pretty sure you haven't. So thanks for listening. Hopefully we'll be good company. And I guess the best place to start is with the letter A. A is for the action. Maybe the first band that Phil fell in love with. Yeah, I mean, there was the Beatles, of course, which could be B. Um, but... Oh, the action were, were brilliant. I obviously must have caught them by accident at a, at a gig in the Marquee Club when they were supporting someone, but I became a complete, complete fan of theirs. And, and they, they, they issued singles and eventually an album that they had recorded was released. And I remember Al Clark, the, the very famous uh, publicist, who was with the Sex Pistols, and he was also with Virgin and and with me when I signed for Virgin. He um, he drove down to my house in Guildford, and on my car bonnet, he laid a copy of the Action album, which had just come out. And when I came out to drive somewhere, it was like finding the, uh, you know, Holy Grail. It was fantastic. Uh, and I got to know them, and Roger... The drummer, who was a huge influence, is still a great friend of mine. So it's it, they were a fantastic band. You know, you, you had to see them. It's that that soul and rock and roll thing at the same time, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it was it was soul and Motown, and it was all the records that were coming in from America. And I used to go and check out the original records because theirs weren't available, and it, they you know they used to play a fantastic selection of songs. So I, I went out and and collected the originals and had a great record collection. And that's how my love of Motown particularly started. And uh, my school band played this stuff. And, and me and the singer, Peter, you know, we, we used to go together and, and then we'd listen to their set. And anything we didn't know, we made up. So we went back to school the next day, you know, for a band rehearsal. And we'd just make up the, whatever we didn't know because we usually knew the, the highlights of the song, but lyrics and stuff and, uh, and middle eights and all that, you know, I mean, we didn't know, so we just made it up. <laughs> but uh, they were a fantastic band. Didn't you fund a book about the action just so you mm. could read it? <laughs> the uh, George Harrison Monty Python thing about wanting to see the film, so he funded Life, Life of Brian, I mean... Uh, they did. They they reformed, which is when I finally got in touch with uh, with Roger, the, the pal, the drummer, and they couldn't afford to edit the film together of their re reform gig, you know. So I paid for that, and then they wanted to. They they thought, you know, at the offer of putting a book uh, a book together. So uh, yeah, I funded that because I wanted to read it. You know, it was like. Anything I could get hold of, because because it was so scarce when they were actually active first time round. So yeah, I did. Quite proud of that. You're listening to the A to Z of Phil Collins with me, Phil Collins. B, 
B is for Band-Aid, the most famous charity song of all time, which featured Phil on drums, and a song that legend has it he recorded in just one take. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'd heard it in the control room, and, uh, you know, I guess Midge, you know, go out there and have a go, so I went out, went out into the studio. It was very intimidating because all the musicians that were there were hanging around in the studio. So... And they didn't have headphones, so really the, you got one guy going out and playing the drums and everyone else just listening to that. They're not hearing the track. And I guess, I don't remember, but maybe there was some terror involved. Um, you know, when you got a bunch of musicians sitting in a room watching you, you kind of try to do your best. So I did it. I did one take, and then I went in to listen to it, and I said... Mitch said, yeah, sounds great. Bob Geldof said, yep. I said, okay, I'll do it again, you know, because I can probably, you know, trim a little bit and just finesse it a little bit. And I said, well, why? Why, why do you want to do it again for? So I said, because uh, <laughs> that's what I normally do, you know, uh, do one take and then maybe do it again, but that was it, that would be it. And then they said, no, don't worry about it, it sounds great. And that was it. I mean, it took longer to set the drums up than it did to play them, you know. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't remember there being any mistakes, otherwise I would have insisted on doing it again, you know. I just felt that I should know this, the tune a bit better before, I mean, no one knew what was going to happen to it. I mean, everybody knew what they hoped was going to happen to it, but nobody really knew. And, and uh, you know, there was a formidable bunch of people there. Really, um, that's when I met Sting and, and Bono was uh, was there. You know, everyone was very nice to each other, even though we all came from different kind of areas of music. Because everyone's always like says about what an amazing day it was, but I always you always watching it thinking that's a lot of egos in one place at one time. Yeah, but nobody really strutted. Not not that I saw anyway. I mean, they did the singing stuff. Um, with uh, Boy George and Paul Young and, uh, you know, the Durans and everybody and the Spandaus. But, but no, it, it was, I mean, as far as I was concerned, it, it was an e ego-free day. And sometimes people behave themselves when they're around other musicians, you know. B is for both sides of the story. C is for Collard and Collard, a very special 1829 piano. Yeah, Collard and Collard, uh, straight strung. Collard and Collard. Uh, my aunt Daisy, she left it to me. Uh, it's the piano that I learnt to play the piano on. I mean, we had one at home, it was not right, but this was a grand piano in her, in her kind of parlour in Chiswick. And... Um, I used to go there every Saturday for piano lessons, which frustrated her a little bit. Um, I mean, we got on fantastically well, but it frustrated her because she could tell when I was reading and when I was playing because of memory. And really, once I heard it and knew where the notes were, I never read it again, which is a drawback if you're trying to read music or learn to read music. So, but anyway, when she died, she left me the piano, and uh, it's now in storage because, you know, I had it restored at one point, but it was it was falling apart. So, But I've, I've, I've still got it, and that's the, uh, the piano that's on the first two albums. And, uh, you know, a couple of mics that probably weren't the correct mics to use. You know, I didn't know what I was doing. I just was trying to get, you know, a nice noise, and um, but that was the piano that was there. 
You should get it out again. You should try and you should try and use it. Instruments should be played, surely. Yeah, they should be. I mean, I have a piano at home, but when something is an antique, sometimes it's not good to have sort of six, eight-year-olds and sort of, you know, 12 year olds banging them. <laughs> D is for dance into the light. D is for Disney and winning an Academy Award for You'll Be In My Heart from the film Tarzan. I was watching your, um, your Academy Award, your Oscar speech. You're, re- you're so emotional in that speech. It's quite, you sort of walk up and you can tell you're proud and pleased. And then I th- it's almost like it, it gets the better of you. It's almost like you realise quite how big it is as you're accepting the award. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's probably, oh, it is true. Um, I haven't watched it again it's lovely. It's really nice. But, you know, I mean, I always used to watch the Oscars and, and you know, when when the earlier songs were up, like Two Hearts and uh, Against the Lodge, I was in the audience and, you know, you wonder what it's like to be up there, you know, and then suddenly you get an opportunity. Um, and you get up there and, you know, and you see Warren Beatty, you see Jack Nicholson, you see your life in front of you, people that you grew up watching, and they're there, you know, applauding you because you won, you know. So it was, and my, my kids were there. It was an emotional moment. I mean, I remember when, you know, I was side of the stage with Randy Newman, you know, because he, he had a song up with Toy Story 2, and... Um, you know, he'd been there like 13 times, <laughs> you know, and I'd been there a couple of times. But, you know, when, when Cher opened the envelope and said, and, and the Oscar goes to, and not, I remember thinking, you know, life goes slowly suddenly. Oh, God. And I went out, and, and yeah, it's hard to believe. But very proud moment, very proud of it. And... uh you know, the film did incredibly well and, you know, it all was a happy ending. As opposed to having that thing where you know the camera's on you and you haven't won and you've got to do the, like, really pleased, dead pleased yeah. for your face that, that, well, someone else goes up to pick it up. Well, it is, it, <laughs> you know, there's a bit like that. I mean, I, I was standing next to Randy Newman and I did feel sorry for him because of the amount of times he'd been up there and it was a lovely song, beautifully sung by Sarah McLaughlin. And... Um, you know, it was just, I just felt bad for him and grateful that, you know, enough people, I mean, it's not a huge academy, you know, there's only about 5,000 people. And so, and I didn't vote for me. <laughs> you know, I mean, I had a voting slip, obviously, because I'm in the academy. And I, I, didn't, I didn't vote, didn't vote for anybody. Because I, I did, I, if I'd have won... Which I did, but I, you know, I would never have known if I was I just won by one vote, so I couldn't handle that. You know, I I, I just wanted to be there for the right reasons, so I, I didn't vote. Did, did you really record "You'll Be in My Heart" in Italian, Spanish, uh, French, and German? Castilian Spanish. So that was it. Extra one, Castilian Spanish. Yeah. I mean, good God, that's quite a lot of work. Well, you know, I mean, you don't think about this when you say yes to doing the job. <laughs> I mean, when I said yes to do the job, originally it was just to write the songs. But as I did the demos to show them what the songs could sound like, they slowly fell in love with my demos. And the, you know, in the end, apparently, they just they decided and they couldn't see anybody else singing them. So 
you know, you do the job, I had a lot of fun, did the English versions, and then someone says, ah, oh, Phil, have you met our international office? <laughs> so I had a meeting with them, and they went to like 50-odd languages, you know. And uh, I remember saying, you know, I, I, can't, I, can't, I can't do this. I've never sung in another language. And they, they just said, well, what about our biggest markets? And they chose four or five, and that seemed doable. And we did the whole thing in a week, you know, like a, a language every couple of days, basically. I had to come back and redo some because, you know, the French being the way the French are, the, 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 the kind of, this is the kind of stuff that the kids grow up listening to it, you know, so you don't want to teach them bad habits. So I had to redo some of the French and, you know, a little bit of Italian. I'm probably, I don't remember exactly, but I remember the French. And it, it, was, it was kind of tricky to get it completely right. Uh, and then in Brother Bear, which I did, you know, the next film I did with them, um, we took on a Japanese song, you know, my song, but in Japanese. And that was difficult. The Japanese were quite interesting because when you start the song, the, the Japanese, you know, translator and kind of the guy that was my coach said, oh, <laughs> this guy must be Japanese. He's fantastic. You know, and so I thought, oh, well, this is easy, you know, because Japanese is the kind of language you can write down phonetically. Right, okay. Uh, you, know, you know, it's all very percussive and... Um, if you write it down correctly, you've got, a, you know, a good, better than 50% chance of getting it right. And uh, he was very impressed until we went into the studio. And then you learn that the Japanese don't like saying no, you know. <laughs> they don't want to offend you. So it's like... So I was there for, you know, longer doing the one song in Japanese than I was probably the whole thing, you know. I mean, it took a while. To, uh, to get it right. But, um, and I did it in the, in the German and the French and the Spanish, you know, as well. Fortunately, I didn't sing um, all the songs in Brother Bear. You're listening to the A to Z of Phil Collins with me, Phil Collins. D is for... Don't lose my number. These with Don't Lose My Number, and if you have a look at this, this is on YouTube, people post comments on the song, and I wanted to ask if you would read those out and react to them, because it's really interesting seeing what people put underneath the video. <laughs> okay, uh, bang, he said, ah, oh, the era when things were fun and videos were entertaining. Yeah, well, they were back in those days, you know. Um, I mean, Don't Lose My Number in particular is a, is a com combination of, of various videos. It's like eight videos in one, pretty much. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's... <laughs> so that, that was good fun to make because we didn't know what the song was about, particularly, or I didn't. And, uh, and so we did it about a lot of things. Um, just noticed Piers Brosnan was the sheriff. No, he, he wasn't the sheriff. <laughs> 
No, it was our production man, Morris Lider, who was the sheriff. You know, all, in that song in particular, everybody that was in it were were from the band or the crew. Yeah. My wife was in it, Jill, at the time, and, and, and David... GWR, I, I think Phil should be a judge on the UK's X Factor. Well, would you ever do that? No. <laughs> I've probably been asked, but but no. I like the last one from Hobo Hobo Poke Maniac. Yeah, in 1991, when I was only 15, my girlfriend made fun of me and broke up with me for liking Phil Collins. Nowadays, if my girl don't like Phil, she can kick rocks. <laughs> I'd rather be alone than with someone who doesn't appreciate good music. Thanks a ton, Phil. <laughs> well, thank you, Hobo. That's that very, very nice of you to say so. That was episode one of the A to Z of Phil Collins, and that was my song, Don't Lose My Number, which brings this episode to a close. I hope you enjoyed listening. In the next episode, we'll tackle songs, letter E to H, and we'll tackle Easy Lover, General Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana, and Gorillas. So do hit subscribe and make sure you get the next show. Hopefully, see you then. Thanks. Thanks.